Hello, it's Christmas Eve. Welcome to Reloved Guitars Workshop. I'm Sam, and uh, today in the workshop, I've got a, a new friend to show you. It is this lovely creature, the uh, Anturia Rockstar, and it's a, a really nice sunburst, red sunburst, um, semi acoustic made in Korea, I believe, um, from the Samic factory. Um, some wires showing there. Um, yeah, nice nice semi-acoustic, beautiful uh, all-round finish. And um, acquired recently, and it's gonna be going through a bit of a reloved process any minute now. Um, it actually plays quite nicely as it is, and it's one of the rare few guitars that I've had through here that do, uh, even though the action uh, around the nut is a little higher than I'd want. It's overall a pretty nicely set action. Um, it has a couple of other issues that I want to put right. One of them is the uh, these tone, the uh, volume and tone for the you know, bridge pickup is uh, loose, and this being a semi-acoustic presents you with quite some problem to get in there to take care of it. So I'll be finding out how to do that um, live on camera. What I mean by that is I don't currently know. Um, I've had a little bit of a go on another semi-acoustic with other bits that needed looking at. Um, and it usually involves a very careful process of pulling the guts out through the hole. Everything is designed to come out through the F-holes or uh, worse, through the pickup holes. Um, actually, I'm not sure about that because it's probably... Yeah, it's a chambered body, so uh, I don't think you can get stuff out through the pickup holes. So it's the F-holes, and that's it for your electronics down here. Um, so we're going to have to get somehow get into there to tighten this up. Um, not quite sure the best way of doing that, but I'll find out. Uh, apart from that, um, it's got some fabulous... Apparently it's got some... Um, what are these? Seymour Duncans in here under these kind of retro-looking plastic covers, which um, is very bright here, which isn't... Uh, they're, they're Quite nice pickups, got a nice tone to them. I'm not a pickup expert, so I can't really tell you how much better they are than uh, regular humbuckers, but I do like them and they have got some bite. Um, but while I'm at it, I might try and um, measure the resistance on them and see what, what it's like. Uh, also, I've got a, a very dodgy, very stiff tuner down here on the D, uh, sorry, on the A string. Um, and these are synthetic Grovers, they're not actually Grovers, but they're made to look like Grovers. Um, so yeah, this one here is particularly problematic and it really does make the tuning difficult. Um, so what I have is a, a bag of new Wilkinson Easy Art tuners, which are similar in style. I ordered particularly for, uh, specifically for this. They are similar in style, um, but they are they're not quite the same in that they the the tuner heads are actually a little bit smaller, which I don't mind. Um, so by comparison, you can probably see right there. Yeah, a little bit smaller, not massively, but you know enough to make a difference. And the body is also a little bit smaller too, and doesn't have that rounded section. Um, but these, these tuners, not only is that A1 a bit knackered, but also they're not sitting flush to the surface of the headstock. So something about the way they've been fixed in means they're all tilting forward. Now, if I can take this apart and have a, a good look at it, maybe you won't, won't have to use these tuners because apart from that A, uh, the one on the A at the moment, that they're, they're otherwise not a problem. So it's a nice guitar. Um, everything else is good about it. It's got a, a fairly long travel uh, tunomatic bridge or a version of a tunomatic bridge which allows you a fair bit of intonation room, which is nice as well. Um, structurally, it's all sound. There is a split here, a little crack, um, where, the, where the edging here, where the binding, the white binding meets the, meets the, the neck, but it's minor. It's missing its original um, scratch plate. Some, the previous owner, Roy, took it off, uh, or somebody pre pre previous to Roy took it off. And I'm, I'm cool with that. I don't much care for those kinds of scratch plates anyway. I think these guitars look just great as they are and I don't mind if it picks up scratches over the years. Um, it's beautifully contoured, uh, uh, no more so than any other 335 or whatever the model it's based on, but it always surprises me that when you look at the kind of the, the contouring, it's, it looks almost impossible to seat um, 
humbucker cover on it and in fact that you can see when you look at it sideways on it is impossible to seat a humbucker cover on there properly because it doesn't sit on a flat surface. Um, it's got a, uh, an, a pretty un, uh, unembellished standard looking neck on it, a uh, fingerboard on it in rosewood. It doesn't have any fancy uh, inlays or anything but that's cool, it's really nice and Antoria is a name from the past um, Originally Japanese, I think, um, but now latterly more, perhaps not not even more recently. But I think they moved to Korea fairly early on, and I think this is a hard to tell, but it could well be a late 80s, early 90s um, Korean one. Um, I'll probably learn a bit more about it as time goes on. Anyway, the point about this video is to uh, get started on this. The interesting thing is, it's so nice to play. I don't want to be without it too long, so I want to do the um, the bits that I have to do and on top of that then the standard um, fret levelling setup uh, as quickly as possible so that I can uh, get on and enjoy playing it over the Christmas period. Um, it has an interesting, I don't know what this is, it's some sort of repair on the end here. It's like a little, oh it's a sticker. Is it a repair? Is it the remains of some sticker? Quite strange really, I don't know what that is. It's coming off, uh, so I'll take it off and see if there's anything hidden underneath. But there we have it. Uh, Antoria Rockstar. Bit of a kind of um, extreme name. Made in, uh, made in Korea, probably late 80s, early 90s, but in fabulous condition for that age, if that's in fact how old it is. All round, lovely guitar, sounds great, great fun to play. I feel like I'm in the Beatles every time I pick it up. So I'm um, gonna make a bit more space in here before we get started and get on with this guitar. Um, get it into tip top condition uh, the way I like them. Okay then, let's get stuck in with this Antoria Rockstar and see what we find as we go. Streamwinder. The uh, person who sold me this uh, very kindly put on some new strings. Uh, there goes that tuner. Hmm. So there's no way it's a shame to take them off so soon, but it's important if we're going to take care of it all and um, sort out the volume tone button issue uh, successfully. And these, these tuners, oh dear, they're all very loose. I don't know what's really happened there one of the reasons why they don't sit correctly is that if they're not screwed down uh, properly then they'll, they'll, they're going to pivot or pivot and sort of lean in one, one or other direction so not surprising so. and in a way this uh, part of the reason I'm doing this guitar now is because I want to play it over my uh, Christmas holiday, so kind of enlightened self-interest. And uh, it is, I don't know what that is, how yeah, strange. Um, yeah, never, never had an Antoria before, um, but certainly I remember one from school where John O'Sullivan, he was uh, a year below me in school, but in one of the sort of bands, uh, he was in one of the bands, I was in sort of a band, but uh, John was in a band called The Time in Coventry. And, oh, Jesus, I always do this, I hate those ends of strings. Ah. Um, I'll cut this bit off. Yeah, so John's band was called The Time, and uh, John had an Antoria SG. And even in those days, it certainly wasn't, we didn't know much about anything, but it wasn't one of the well-known brands that we as schoolboys kind of obsessed over, which was you know, obviously your, your Gibsons and your Fenders and so on. This is pretty much all we knew. And I think we knew, I think we knew about Yamahas and Kramers were, Hamers, Hamers were big in the late 70s, early 80s. Oh. Okay, so off comes the strings. Let's just cut them off here, make it easier. Um, 
Yeah, so it, it certainly wasn't a big name in those days. Um, I'm, I kind of I remember seeing him playing it and thinking, "Hang on, this is a, this is a crap quality or cheap guitar. It's a no-name guitar." Because back then, Antoria was certainly wasn't uh, a prestigious name. And in a funny sort of way, a lot of those '80s made in Japan '80s guitars have become. Uh, have since become, let's take this off as well. Yeah, they've since become certainly very desirable things. And the, the, the funny part about that is that in, in the 70s, uh, uh, or late 70s, a, a K or a satellite guitar it just was then junk. Um, they, were, they were terrible quality guitars. Nobody took them seriously. In fact, my first guitar was uh, a satellite. And I couldn't have been, I couldn't have had a worse guitar. In fact, about the only other guitar on par with that for crapness was uh, K, which I think you also, I think you got a K guitar in Woolworths, I think, at the time. And the satellite, I think, pretty much came from. Um, and it was mine. Certainly came from a friend's mum's catalogue. Uh, they were they were just rubbish. And it's really funny to watch history kind of intervening, and to the point where the the satellite guitar now. If you look on eBay, uh, there are people trying to sell them for anything between sort of thirty to two hundred pounds, and they're all busy kind of yelling. Uh, about their, their classic antique Japanese, made in Japan, MIJ, classic, beautiful strat copy, blah blah blah, and rabbiting on about the quality of those things. And they were at the time, and, and as I say, remain uh, just tra trash. They were horrible. Um, it's just, it's just, it is funny to see how kind of uh, history is rehabilitated them. That's one of the screwdrivers. Anyway, of course, it will, it, it'll always be bound to do that when somebody thinks there's money in it for them. Um, I was actually looking for one of those uh, satellites uh, the other day. I wanted to bid on one of them. and um, Well, not bid, but uh, snipe on one of them. And the reason I want uh, just want one is I'd like to... Um, I'd like to give it a, a go to see if I can actually make it play um, because it certainly didn't play back then. It was the Satellite 65T, which you, you'll probably have seen yourself on eBay, was a plywood um, and you know, it wasn't even the kind of modern laminate that you might get uh, a quality Korean Squire Strat from the late 80s made out of. It was, it was a hideous cheap plywood affair um, and it's where plywood guitars got their name um, but it was terrible and it it was three-quarter size so it's a short scale thing it was really made for kids it wasn't oh there you go off comes the nut uh, it wasn't a serious guitar now of these tuners by the way a majority of them are rattling and coming loose straight away so that's one it's like challenge uh, so I'm going to take them off, and as I say, the, the objective is, to, is just to see if they really are, or if the one I'm worried about really is uh, unsalvageable, in which case we'll replace the whole set. Um, I might do that anyway, depending on how they look. But yeah, so back in the late 70s, early 80s, I got myself um, this satellite three-quarter size short-scale Strat copy, and uh, made of plywood, horrible frets, horrible... Uh, Horrible cheap components, horrible tremolo, horrible bridge. Um, and basically, just unlovable and unplayable. And the action was a mile high. Uh, God knows what the, the evenness or otherwise of the frets was. Um, and now they're just <laughs> they're reappearing and people trying to get a couple of hundred quid for them by telling you that they're Japanese and they're classic. Um, 
and I wanted I wanted to try and get hold of one. I'm still looking for one, but I won't pay more than thirty quid for one. Um, and even then, it would purely be a sort of sentimental, uh, t technical challenge for myself: is can I take what I think is the worst guitar, probably one of the worst guitars ever made, and can I make it playable? I like that sort of challenge. Um, but I certainly will not be trying to sell it on as a made in Japan classic Stratocaster because it isn't. And nor are the, the nor are the K's and other such guitars of the era. I mean they are they have a curiosity value now, that's absolutely for sure, but they were and are junk as far as instruments go. Um, and I just I think it's funny that the years have turned them in some people's eyes into desirable Classic, classic guitars, which they are absolutely not. Anyway, you know, caveat emptor. Is that, is that what they say? Buyer beware. Okay, so it feels okay. It's this one I'm worried about. Now, it, with the load off, it seemed to ease off. In fact, it has eased off considerably. In fact, that's because it's not that one. It's this one. That's. But they're they're all loose now. It was under load that it was um, causing a problem so we're just going to have to see we'll try them on once more and see if they work otherwise we will revert or we'll switch to the Wilkinson new set um, if these are serviceable then I don't I have no particular desire to switch to the Wilkinson's there's no reason to we can keep those as a, uh, a spare set for any other guitar uh, there have been a number of other ones that will get over time. So yes, so this is going going back to that story in the in the olden days, even as a school kid when uh, when John O'Sullivan um, took to the stage and the time with his uh, Antoria SG copy, you know we were even then we were fairly snotty about it knowing that it was a it was a very cheap copy of a famous guitar. Now, I'm not a fan of stickers on guitars, so I'm going to take these little bits off. Partly because I have no intention of selling this on in a hurry. So, um, yeah, so, so John's guitar was no name, and as a result, you know, we were quite snotty about it. But um, what we also knew is that it played better than any of the guitars that we possessed between us or any of the other better named guitars that any of the other uh, band members had. Um, so his, his guitar became legendary, it was superb and you know occasionally we like some revered holy object, some relic, we got to put our hands on it and, and at those moments we could feel the quality of that action and it really was down to the action. I mean we, we didn't really know anything else about it other than what we could feel with our hands with our fingers and you know even as fairly crap guitarists that we were then or well, certainly I was and still am uh, could tell that it was something special so it might even have been there that I got my sort of uh, undying love of a well set up guitar maybe it's also possible that there I got the sort of idea but it wasn't impossible for a cheap guitar to be set up brilliantly well because um, you know, there was one right before my eyes that was set up phenomenally well. We could we could tell. Okay, so we've got all the loose bits off this chap. Um, it definitely uh, actually calls itself a solid top. Interesting. It's definitely made in Korea. It says so on the inside. So I, believe what I read. Just gonna give it a quick all over clean with the uh, like a fluid solvent. I always do this even if I'm gonna do more intensive cleaning later. It's really good to do this because in doing it you, you, or, or, you know you get to clean the, the obvious guck off the fingerboard. Um, in this case it's fairly clean to begin with but it's, if it isn't you can give it a, a good sort of initial clean. But while you're doing it, you can also get quite a good sense of any of the other um, problems that it has. So here I'm, I'm looking at the degree of uh, fret wear. And these are 
these have been treated sometime in the past, these frets, so I have a feeling they might be quite level. Um, I think somebody may have done this. Not, I didn't ask Roy, uh, the guy who sold it to me. Um, but I stop rattling you. But I think what's clear is that um, Roy's a musician, he plays in a band, and uh, so I think it's kind of evident that he would have treated this nice, uh, nicely and taken care of it within certain limits. Um, so anyway, the, the, we'll know whether the frets have indeed been uh, levelled or not when we come to um, do a fret level check in a short while. So I'm just taking a swipe down the uh, gap between the, fret, uh, the end of the fingerboard and the pickups. It's not something you can often get into, so it's nice to get some of that dust out. Okay, so I'm just going to swipe over the um, finish here with these switches on these guitars always worry me. They always make me feel they're coming loose, which of course in this case the volume knob certainly has. Um, But yeah, it's, it's always threatening to come loose, which then leaves you with quite a task on your hands as to how you get in there and do that fiddly tightening up work. Because there's no point tightening up the guitar or the uh, volume or tone pot at the expense of um, breaking something on the inside that you can't see. So it's quite a tricky uh, job to keep the body of the unit still while you do the tightening bit. Um, I've got a tool to do that with the input jack, but I don't. That tool, that same tool, won't work when it comes to holding the, uh, the volume knob. Now, no doubt there is such a tool, but uh, I declare I don't have it. So, looking at this, there's a bit of wear on the finish of the neck there, which. Might be nice to just tidy up somewhere along the line so that we have a, a really smooth finish to hold on to. And um, I was on the lookout for clean dusting cloths for shining things up. Right, so that initial um, once over allowed me to have a, a quick look at the finish. It's, it's not perfect, it's, it's been used. It could do with what I'll probably give it, which is a bit of a, a once over with some scratch remover. It's quite a nice last stage polish, um, which I've got some here, we can, we can certainly do that. Um, but it's never gonna be concourse or showroom ready. It's not, it's not that kind of guitar and it's not new enough for that. Um, and I don't really, want it for that purpose, I want it to play, uh, and it's going to be my band guitar, I think, one of them anyway, I think that and a Strat or a SG that I've got will, will be the sort of gigging pair. Okay, so the first thing for me to just uh, do a check on, before we do anything, just looking down, down at the neck, we've got a fair bit of uh, fret wear down here from the st single strings where they're cut into the frets. And then beyond that, it extends up to about here, but beyond that, there's a sort of general fret wear. Now looking at them from the side, they're a little bit flattened, so they could do with uh, a reprofiling and the leveling. Um, but I have to be very careful because there isn't you know, thousands of years of life left in these things. So the first thing I'm gonna do I'm going to just look at the neck with the strings off and have a look at what the shape or the profile of the neck is doing right now um, before we start any work on the frets. And I, you can do it with all manner of nice straight edges, but I'm going to do it with my eye because I just feel comfortable doing it that way. I'm not recommending it's the only way or the right way to do it. It just suits me. You can get a ruler with special... Uh, things cut out for the frets to sit in, so you can do that way. Now to me, 
it's almost perfectly flat anyway I'd be quite happy to level my frets with that the way it is now putting it on the deck again will create some uh, some gravitation on it the gravity will pull it down and then you know we have to position a block somewhere where it's gonna it's not gonna cause uh, undue bend in it now it always will you'll either be bending it because the weight of this will be pressing it down that way or you'll be letting the neck dangle that way in which case it will be convex um, so it's a kind of you can't really win you could you could have it set up on a, a special jig but that might cost you a load of money now these pickups aren't perfectly placed for my liking I think I've got Morris coming to visit me just now hello Morris Yes, welcome. Let me shut the door so I don't freeze on this cold winter's night. Now, if you want to go anywhere, Morris, you go on here. Okay? And just settle down there because I need you to just... Yeah, it's nice and warm. Don't leave the radiator. It's nice and warm. You don't want to climb up on the workbench. Um, yeah, stay where you are. If you go here, you'll crash. All right, stay on there. Sit. <laughs> Sit. Don't try and jump. It won't work. You'll go the long way around now. Morris. Psst. He's unstoppable. He's going to appear any second now on there. Morris. And then we'll get on top of the guitar. And then I'll put that down there and he can stay in this gap. You can stay here. If that's where you stay, that's fine. Here. Okay, so first step for me uh, is because I'm interested and because I keep a tally of it, I'm going to check. Um, actually, I'm not going to do that at all. What I really should do is uh, I should really mask off the neck, but it's not going to help while he's putting wet fur all over it. So, out of interest, I just know I'm curious. Okay, there's a uneven fret. That's one. Right, Morris. Two, three, four. So there are some uneven frets, which which is kind of what we'd expect. All right. So oh, you're such a star. Ooh, and this wet nose, but it's very sweet, and I can't resist it. Morris, somebody told me that I should be paying you more than I'm paying you for doing these videos. What do you reckon? You would say that. Come on, how much more do you want? You've got a warm home, got all the food you need, your sister lives with you, your mum lives with you. Not that she, no, I know she hates you, but she lives with you. And you've got your big mean Uncle Sid who also lives with you. What more could you ask for? Eh? Hmm? And you get to come in here and Harass me all the time. Say goodbye. Goodbye. Just stay there. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to mask off the fingerboard on this guitar. And we're going to do that to protect it from the fret work that will be done on this guitar. And the reason I do fret work at all is... A couple of reasons, I suppose. The first one is that um, it obviously, working on the frets will clean them up um, and get rid of any blemishes, any grooves or dents or scratches or chips. And also, in, also it's an opportunity to return them to a beautiful, beautiful, shiny, playable finish, which um, everybody likes. Can you come on, lump. Uh, that's that's a, a great reason for doing it. But I think the primary reason, don't come up. A primary, the primary reason for doing it is that um, when we, when the frets are level, uh, the playing action can be set a lot lower um, than it it can be set if you've got uneven frets. So, an uneven, a high fret on your uh, guitar neck will result in strings clipping or, or touching 
the top of a, a fret somewhere further down the fretboard and that obviously creates either a choking sound or a buzzing sound and uh, what I've discovered in the time I've been doing this is that all, and that means 100% of the guitars I've worked on, all guitars have uneven frets and um, and that means that every guitar that, you, that I've seen and every guitar that you see um, has, uh, has uneven frets and not only does it have uneven frets it has a lot of uneven frets in my experience it is uh, on average 60% or more uneven frets per guitar and that's quite a lot so your guitar will have uneven frets and the consequence of those uneven frets will be that at certain places um, the strings when you fret one note the strings the note uh, further down the fretboard that string will buzz against a high fret and in buzzing or choking it will restrict your ability to play and so what you find is that most guitars yours included will have been have the action set uh, high enough to overcome those limitations and um, because if if you have uneven frets you can negate the problem by setting the action really high which is why most guitars that you've ever played will have quite high most guitars the, the numerical majority of guitars you've played will have had a fairly high action um, and it's, you know often People will then get a guitar like that and they will just immediately go home and try and wind down the bridge action or um, yeah, wind it down um, and come run, run pretty much straight into the um, buzzing problems because the underlying frets are still uneven. And basically the only way to get around that or to overcome it is to um, level all the frets on the guitar as a sort of basic start point and that's what I do every time at the kind of heart of doing a service or a setup so for me there's absolutely no good old Norris you can settle down there that's fine you just shift your bum so you just want to settle down settle down thank you um, so the heart of a setup for me is leveling the frets Morris, I suggest you move. It is disgustingly cute. So, if you don't level your frets, Morris, um, what you'll find is that you won't be able to set a low action. And if you do level your frets, you'll regain the freedom to set an action of your choosing um, which for most people is, is as low as it will go. Most people like a low action. And certainly if you're a beginner, um, most beginners prefer a lighter action. Oh, Morris, this is dangerous stuff. Just go over there. Most beginners like a, an easy low action um, because it, if nothing else, it makes learning the guitar a lot easier. Um, can you just settle down so I don't feel like I'm going to chop your head off with this? Yeah, he does need to be paid more. He needs to be paid danger money at this rate. Anyway, to, like I said, just watch out, you. Like I said, before Morris risked his life in a stunt, he should never have done. Right, just stay right there. That's nice, Morris. Stay right there. Don't do anything. No, don't get involved. Can you just sleep? Look what's that over there. Mm. Yeah, anyway, so yeah, long and short of this is move your head. Um, oh god, it's so sticky and cold. Uh, I always do the setup, uh, do the fret leveling as a core part of the setup. There's no point trying to do, um, in my view, no point trying to do a setup. Sorry, Morris, you're going to have to go down because I can't do this. 
Um, no point trying to do a setup if you don't level the frets first. Um, or sorry, put it another way, there's no point trying to do a setup if you haven't got level frets. And since I've found my experience is that the vast majority, 99% of guitars that I see, don't have level frets, then it actually just quite simply means the first thing I have to do is level the frets to make any kind of setup um, meaningful. If I was unscrupulous, I think that I could probably just charge people for setups, and, and it sounds like there are some people who do that, and for their setup fee, these people seem to get a bit of a tweak and a fiddle with the action, um, and I'm hearing quite often that they're not getting much else beside that. Or, that's not true, they get, they get that work done, but because the um, person hasn't addressed the underlying uneven frets, which as I say, is found on all guitars, um, because those aren't, those aren't dealt with, um, the result is that that setup doesn't feel like anything to the individual. Um, because they can't, they're expecting an action to be set lower, and uh, the guy doing the setup isn't able to set it any lower because he or she hasn't done uh, any fret leveling. Therefore, there is no lower they can go with the action, no matter how much wire wool they clean the, the frets with. Um, and the result is that the person gets their guitar back, feeling pretty much the way it felt when they sent it in, um, which I'm hearing time and time again is not oh, sorry I'm hearing time and time again isn't very satisfactory and that, that's completely understandable I wouldn't be very pleased so it just doesn't seem to be any point in doing any of this unless you create the basic level playing field to use a, a metaphor and that's what all this is about and so what I'm doing now, as you can see, is being very fiddly and very precise with um, masking off uh, the, the fretboard, the fingerboard, so that whatever we do with the frets, that the underlying rosewood is protected and doesn't come to any harm. And as you can see, the reason I did all these careful cuts is because all the way up the, the neck we're going to require different sizes or different thicknesses of tape uh, because we can't cover up the frets we have to leave the frets exactly exposed um, and so I found that the simplest way and believe it or not the quickest way and the most reliable way to do this is to pre-prepare a set of um, different thicknesses of strips and you'll, you'll if you do it one day yourself you'll figure out what combination of bits of paperwork for you but this board and this sequence works for me quite well it even leaves me with a few left over which I'll need um, in case some of these things these bits of paper peel back while I'm working on the frets in which case I then have a couple of spare bits to hand just to seal up the gaps because what we don't want is for a piece of the masking tape to come off and to carry on working on the neck because that would Kind of destroy the or ruin the, the rosewood um, for what because we couldn't be bothered to cut some more paper or stop long enough to put the strip back on anyway so that's my that's what i'm doing right now and after that we'll get into the um the process of, of leveling these frets and it has three parts to it um, the first part is that we actually physically level the frets. Uh, the second part is that once we've leveled them, the frets will have a flat top. So the second part of the operation would be to reshape the frets or reprofile them, give them a rounded shape instead of a flattened top. Because the flattened top is very undesirable for a couple of reasons. One, one is that um, it messes up the intonation because the intonation point wanders away from the top of the fret closer towards the nut um, towards the bridge which can be as much as a millimeter's worth of difference which can upset the intonation 
And the second reason is obviously that a flat surface with scratches on it left by the file is not a good surface to press strings against. Not only will it feel terrible, it will sound terrible and it will break your strings. So reprofiling is critical that we reshape the fret. Um, but once we've done that, then we also need to um, polish the fret back up to a very, very high degree of shine and very smooth so that it can be it's conducive with playing strings or strings bending on top of it. So three stages, level, reprofile and polish. And each stage requires a great deal of patience uh, and it requires some skill. There are, there are low and high tech ways of doing them, these jobs. Um, my experience has shown that for most of these jobs that I'm doing, you can do them without expensive tools. Uh, where there are expensive tools that you can buy, they, they tend just to save time and effort. Um, but you can do them with hand tools. So I have some, bought some of the, have bought some of the time-saving tools because they make things a little bit more consistent and uh, easier to do. Um, but you don't have to have those. You can do this job uh, with some fairly simple low-tech things. What, the one tool that I think you you have to have to make this job doable. I mean, it is possible to level all of your frets f with uh, little bits of sandpaper. You don't need necessarily a fret leveling file. But for to assure that you've got levelness all the way down, uh, all the way up and down your neck, I would. I strongly recommend a fret levelling file um, and that might cost you 30 quid or maybe a, you find a cheaper version for 25 quid or something like that. Um, and the thing to think about with any of these things is once you've done this on one guitar you own, I guarantee it, you'll do it on all of them because you'll see, the first one you do it on, you'll see the scale of the difference it makes. And then once you've seen that difference, you want to do it on either the other guitars you currently own or certainly any other guitar you own after in the future. So for most of us guitar um, nerds, we will have several guitars already. Um, so you know, if you pay for this a couple of these tools, then you can be pretty certain that you're going to uh, you're very likely to have have a few other guitars to to use it on and if you don't then it's also statistically far more likely that over the years you will uh, have more than one or two other guitars in which case you can use your tool on any of those guitars in the future so point being is it's a it's actually a small investment when you break it down over a number of guitars and over a number of years playing. And my experience is for the amount of payoff that you get, uh, you know, the, the scale of the result that you get for doing this um, is well worth the investment. And then of course if you really wanted to, you can do it for friends. Um, they can come to you and you can get back your investment by charging them a couple of quid if you want to do their frets. Anyway, um, so it's, it's not doesn't require rocket science. It does require a little bit of investment, um, but an investment that actually, when you when you stop and work out the amount of pleasure you get out of playing, is, is pretty small. And multiply, multiply it by all the guitars, or divide it by all the guitars you you have had and you ever have. And it's not much. Now what I'm doing here is I'm just masking off some of the uh, body here because I don't want to scratch anything while I'm working in this area. And I'll also cover off the, the pickups, or well, this pickup anyway, the next pickup, so that um, you don't run any risk of either sandpaper, a bit later on in the process, or uh, fret file doing any damage to it. So it's um, again quite easy to do. This, this masking tape cost me £1.10 
per roll and I would much prefer to use up a few rolls of that than I would uh, cause any damage to the finish of a guitar, mine or someone else's, particularly when it's a customer's guitar. They trust you with the guitar and its finish and they will not be happy if your sandpaper scrapes the hell out of the nice finish while you're busy making their frets nice and shiny. Okay, so from where I stand, that looks all pretty safe and tidy. And even to this end, I'm just going to go a bit further up with tape up there. So if the sandpaper runs off the end, that's fine. Right, so here's the point where, for my curiosity and interest, I'm going to um, I'm going to do a, a check of the number of uneven frets on this guitar. Um, you don't have to do this if you were going to do fret levelling, you could just grab your fret levelling file and plow straight in. Um, but I'm interested in knowing what the state of the neck is for sort of general nerdish professional interest. So I get my fret levelling fret rocker, I should say, and um, what I'll do is just start checking, looking for whether I can rock this uh, backwards and forwards over the middle of three frets and if I can it tells me that that fret is high uh, relative to the frets around it so I just mark onto the paper where that fret appears to be higher than the surrounding ones. Now I often go off into a lot of detail about this but it's worth remembering that this thing is not absolute it doesn't tell you that fret is actually high what it tells you is that it appears high relative to the frets either side of it. And it doesn't even tell you which one of the frets either side of it could be causing uh, that rocking. Because it might be the one to the right being low, which allows it to rock. Or it might be both of them a little bit. Or it might be these are both even and that one's a bit high, in which case it will still rock. You don't know it and you don't need to know it. That's the interesting bit. Don't get hung up about it. All of this is a game of uh, relativity. We're just measuring relative evenness, not absolute evenness. When we get leveling with our fret leveling file, we will be taking everything down a little bit in order to achieve relative evenness between all of them. Okay, and if you try to work it out, it can get a bit of a headache if you're trying to work out whether one is actually high and one is actually low. The issue is, it's a bit like trying to judge your position in the universe. The question is relative to what? You know, it's all relative. Position is all relative. So... The only time it matters whether one is actually high or the clicking is caused by the others nearby being low and therefore making the one you're on appear high is if you're going to do the work on these things with um, a kind of spot treatment, i.e. working just on one fret on its own. And that way, that's where it does become relevant because if you if this indicates it's high and you just start wearing this down, you actually do need to know whether this is likely to be high or that's likely to be low. And it's quite hard to, to know and frankly I enjoy using this file because it saves me from that worry. I don't have to work it out. I'm doing them all at once and I know that I will end up with a level set of frets and that I'll have been saved the misery of trying to work out which one is actually high or which one is actually low. I mean, there is a there is a logic. If you think, if you go here and it's it's clicking, and you go, okay, it's one of three things. Either that one's higher than those two, or this one's the same as that one, but that one's low, or this one's the same as that one, and that one's low. And you could probably work it out by checking that one and then checking the next one. Well. But it doesn't tell. It doesn't actually tell you the truth. That still could be low, um, but these two could be high, which keeps it from rocking on that one. So tricky. 
And if you start working on this, it's a good assumption that the one that is rocking is high because frets tend to be higher more than they tend to be low. So on that basis, if you're doing a spot treatment, I would say assume the one you've marked as high is high, but be conscious that if it isn't, what happens is when you take it down a bit, you will find other things springing up as you keep checking and you might need to then level something else. Um, so when you're doing it that way, it is a much more fluid situation and you have to be a, a lot more aware of the impact of the thing you've just leveled with your sandpaper, for example, um, and what's happening and has it thrown up a new uh, nearby, new, new frets nearby that are now showing as uneven. In my experience, you do actually get there in the end. It's not, it's not too difficult, as I say, because the assumption is a good one that you always begin with the assumption that the fret that you've marked is in fact high because statistically it's more likely to be that, um, but you have to be aware that it isn't an absolute and you have to keep an eye on n new problems that are created as you go along. And those new problems tend to be revealed um, when your assumption is incorrect about which one's high and which one's low. Anyway, okay, we've got quite a high one here on the second to last fret as it happens. I'll put a fair bit heavy, heavy marker on there. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just, I think I'm going to unplug this and take you for a quick walk here. So, um, I think you should be able to see, okay? Now, we've got an interesting situation. We've got uh, a number of frets, not many, that are showing as uneven. We've got one here that's showing as quite, uh, quite a lot higher, quite significantly high. Um, and these are, so the, none of them are too heavy. Um, but So the question is, is, do we want to do all of them? Which if we do all of them in this method, means we have to reprofile every single fret and then um, refin it or polish every single fret. Or if there were perhaps even fewer than this, we might choose to just fix one, the one or two. But it's interesting that that process then wouldn't deal with the... Um, dents here. So my view is when you've got some dents here, a you know, 20 or 30 or more percent of frets uneven, then it's better to use this. Um, to do otherwise will just be creating a lot of work. Okay, so um, and then just to give you a quick view, um, we haven't actually counted this up now, but the majority of, out of 29 guitars there, um, 25 have got 50 percent or more percent is about here. Only four have less than 50% of their total number of frets uneven. The absolute majority have 50 or more, but actually it's really 60 or more. A good 50% have 60 or more percent, right down to 80s, 83s, 90s. So this guitar already looks like it will be in the lower region, probably because it's been done before on this guitar, possibly, um, judging by the finish on the frets. But um, it, it will be a relatively good one compared to a lot of oh, sorry, a lot of them on the, the chart over there. So um, just counting them up, I think we've probably I don't know how many, 22 frets. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22 frets. So we miss out the first two because we're the first and last one because we can't check those. So we're out of 20 and it's 1, 2, 3, 4. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There you go. A resounding 50% uh, for this guitar. Um, and if I'm going to make a note of that, I'm going to stick it to the leaderboard. You might as well do it since we've done it for everything else. 50%, it's not brilliant, but it's also not particularly bad. Certainly, um, probably in a minority. So we have the Antoria Rockstar. Fifty percent. I like it when it has twenty-two frets because it makes my maths a lot easier. Maths, which I'm pretty crap at. So I'm just going to pin that where it lives on the board because we don't really have much room um, anymore. Okay, 
So having uh, identified the uneven frets, what I'm going to do now is, and this is where you would start if you were uh, going to do this with a fret levelling file, is we just literally take a marker pen, a permanent marker, and we just draw marker pen on top of all the files. I keep saying this, on top of all the frets, um, all the way down the neck. And this marker pen, its purpose is to show us where the file has taken away metal and where it hasn't. And that's that's kind of useful because it, it gives us a, an easy way of seeing um, where we've missed the parts of the neck, which we can go back over and cover. Um, but it also very quickly reveals high spots and low spots, so it confirms the things we supposed. Um, and sometimes it reveals things we didn't see, which are often sometimes can be troughs. Um, and those troughs sometimes can be problematic because to get a level set of frets, we have to um, we have to kind of go, we have to take, keep taking material off until we reach the bottom of the lowest trough. Okay, so here we go. This is the process. We just get going. Start on the edge and just run down and run off the edge. I'm going to try not to beat too heavy on all of this because I'm conscious of the age of these frets and there isn't that much metal left available to us on this guitar. Okay, so wow, blimey, interesting. Hmm. Quick look at what we've got. Uh, some some frets untouched, like that one. Everything else touched, a bit missing there. Uh, this fret here not touched. Um, and the one I marked is really high, hardly touched at all, so quite strange. And run backwards the other way now. And do my best to take off level amount of all of these and I can now see what shows up as two actually three wow, that's amazing okay so here's an interesting proposition right so we said we said that this apparent high spot could be caused either by that being actually high or this being low what it's showing me up here is that this bit here is significantly low, right? Which has caused that to appear high. Um, we have a similar situation up here with another low spot and another low spot here. And that's quite a challenge because we now have to decide how we're gonna get down to that given relatively small amounts of fret material left in this neck um, but it's just you know that's the age of the guitar that's where we're at I mean there is enough um, we can do it it's just I need to be careful what we can do is while we're here we can just go back with our rocking tool and we can see that um, we've still got even though we've taken a lot off this pit here which which if that had been high that would have cured it but because it's not that that's high it's this that's low we're still finding oh, we're still got a rocking motion now what that means is that even though that isn't isn't um objectively high or it's not high above the the fretboard compared to anything else uh when you're fretting a note here this does then appear to be high because this is low um, and that's the challenge of these things now whether that's been hit too far in or banged too far in at the point of um, installation or what who knows but it is it is what is going to cause us a bit of a problem so I'm going to go once more down the line here completely missing the last fret altogether 
this one's just about clipped it here um, and the other two spots still haven't bitten but we're kind of near enough there to not to worry too much let's just check it yeah hardly anything there now tiny a little tiny amount There's one at the end. Uh, that appears to be low, so I don't think we need to worry about that last rope because it's low. But that's the, that's the only kind of the only lucky bit about this. It's the very last one. It's still showing. It's not cutting anything, but it's low. Okay, so that's a fairly scary process. What's also important to note here is have we got down to the bottom of the grooves that have been cut by wear and tear? And a quick check will show that we've we've taken enough away to get rid of those grooves there are no more grooves there now we have move on to the next stage which is straight on to um, the uh, reprofiling part and for this we take the marker pen and go right back over the top of all the now flattened frets and we're going to next stage now we're going to use a concave tool to run this way over the frets and in doing so it's going to shave off the edges of the frets and help to round them off into a con uh, convex humped shape and that's vital as I mentioned before to restore its shape into the proper kind of arch shape um, which allows the intonation to sit in the right place on the fret and also means that we are able to um uh, we've got a good shape then to, to work on when we come to um polishing it okay so going straight on let's take our tool our um reprofiling tool and i just basically work up and down the fret and the purpose of this is to let the concave shape of this tool wear away the sticking out shoulders of the fret so it's, by doing that it's taking away the, the flattened shape and leaving us with a rounded shape but in doing so I'm making sure that I leave a very thin strip of um, marker pen on the top and so long as I leave that thin strip of marker pen on the top it tells me uh, that I've reshaped the fret but I haven't reduced the overall height of it because the, the little black line tells me um, I've, I've um, filed away the, the rest of the file but I haven't touched that particular bit on the top and this file is beautifully designed to do just that and so now I can work my way down all the frets in the same fashion um, kind of carefully making sure that whatever I do I don't go lower than uh, than the fret was before and my, my guide is a little black line hello sweetie hello. come in i'm just going to put you on hold for a minute okie dokie right here we are um all the frets now reprofiled and we are now ready to uh, do the next stage which is the sanding and the principle of this is <clears throat> we need to get rid of the scratching on the, the marks left by particularly this file here very rough file and um, so we're going to need to take away those marks by using 240 paper and then once we've got rid of those marks we can go to an 800 and after the 800 we can go to a set of micro mesh papers which will take us all the way through to 12,000 but the important bit about this is to make sure that we um, Get rid of all of the scratches left by the fret leveling file and if we don't do that uh, we will end up with scratchy um, frets which would be pretty horrible to play so uh, 
at some point in this we're going to need to take a very close look at the each, each of the frets, in fact every single one of them, to make sure that we've actually uh, replaced the previous um, grade of scratches with um, the later one. It'd be really cool if I could actually undo this and clean out these lenses, they're a bit grimy. But anyway, so it's going to require some really close up looking um, and along with that we can um, use a bit of lighter paper, I'll show you how that works in a minute. But So the first point about this is let's get going. Um, I'm going to use my fingers on this to uh, get kind of up and down over the frets. We want to um, we want to take off these scratches but we want to do it in a way that doesn't put a flat spot. Okay, Because at the moment we've got perfectly levelled frets and we want to retain that. So two things, don't flatten it anymore. So use your fingers to, to get up and over the frets in a kind of curved natural way. And the second bit is to make sure that all of the frets get an equal amount of sanding so that they all, if they go down at all in height, um, they go down an even, even amount. So I'm just pressing down and watching this tape here start to peel back. So straight away, remember I said earlier on, is do not let this come off whatever happens. So we'll just stick that another layer of tape on there to stop it coming off. And so then we're back to oh, more tape coming off there. Damn it. That's going to require some. Oh, this church bells have gone off at 11 o'clock at night. It must be a midnight mass for Christmas Day. It's not midnight, so. Uh, anyway. Okay, so I'm going to have to t stick a bit more paper down here. And we have to cut some more in a minute because we're running out of. Um, running out of strips but anyway so we're back to this and we're bringing our fingers up and over the tops of the frets and trying to make sure that all the frets get an equal amount of uh, coverage so that if they do go down at all uh, in height which they will do microscopically I mean this paper is pretty rough so uh, it will take off a certain amount of metal, no doubt about it. Um, we want to make sure that if it does, or however much it does, it does the same for all the frets. Uh, so that we retain a relative evenness between them all. Uh, in other words, we don't undo the good work we've just spent so much time doing. Um, now it's my experience that very often doing this it's the, the last fret that gets left behind, uh, the last ones to, to be done, so giving them a little bit more extra special attention. Funny to hear the bells at this time of night. I don't think I've ever heard that one even on Christmas before, but okay well so when you get to the end of your first bit of paper um, brush off the grip and carry on um, we we'll check after the second strip of sandpaper We'll do, yeah, we'll do a visual check then. It's a pretty mucky uh, process, so expect a fair bit of dust and crap uh, to be spread all over your fingerboard and all over the guitar as well. It will need a clean with the um, naphtha afterwards to get it clean again. It's okay. What we expect. Sometimes it gets quite hard to hold on to the paper. Okay, I can see the um, paper's peeling back here. Be careful that it doesn't 
reveal any fretboard. Right, so this is where I'm going to do a visual check. And I need some good light. Probably out of focus for you, but sorry about this. So, actually, what I'll do is just want a little bit of 2000 paper. I'm going to go across the grain with the 2000 paper. And it's quite interesting that what that does is sort of dulls the frets. At least it dulls it according to the direction that we've been currently sanding in. And it gives it makes it actually a lot easier. It cuts down all the glare, but it makes it suddenly very easy to spot the uh, the outstanding pit marks. Um, and the principle I go by here is that if I see any, then I'm obliged to carry on working the uh, frets with that level, same level paper, until there aren't any of those marks. Now there, I have seen two or three already, so that has committed me. There's another couple, committed me to. Uh, another whole sheet of paper. Um, so it's kind of not necessarily worth really looking any further at that because we're going to need to do it again after this next one. Pretty crappy, um, crappy dust there. Okay, now what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to use a block which is somewhere. Somewhere we have a foam block with point on it. What have I done with it? This is the uh, tricky bit now. Foam block, please. Is it in there? Is it in there? It's not there. It's not in there with the tuners. Okay, so right the second. I don't know where it is. It's a square one. This is a sandpapery one. It's not quite what I want. It might just have to suffice. I can't figure out where the other one's gone. No, I can't. Okay, well, let's see if this one does it. It's a bit sharper than I'd like, but it'll do. sharp it kind of destroys the uh, paper a bit too quickly. Somewhere, somewhere I have a uh, pointed foam block which is perfect for this but it's not this isn't quite it. Anyway. I'm going to have another close-up look. Uh, that was annoying. I lost that thing. Close-up look and get the light right. As I say, this is the critical stage. If, um, if you move on too soon, you'll just end up basically shining up a uh, fretboard with loads of little tiny pits that will end up feeling like you're um, you're scratching your way around the fretboard, and it's pretty horrible. So it's pretty much almost there. Yeah, I'd say it's pretty much there. So I'm going to switch grades now. And 
and this is where we move to an 800. I'm wondering if I can use these as a pad. Maybe I can. Move to an 800 and now the 800. So the 800 now is trying to remove the, the 240 scratches, um, which is actually not too difficult. It doesn't take too long for this to happen. Uh, For this, but it won't be too long before uh, those 240 scratches are down to a nice smooth 800. Again, the, this is not a stage to be rushed. If you rush this, you, you pay for it in terms of the overall smoothness of the um, stretch you end up with. So if, you, if you're not in a hurry, or if you've got time, just give it the time it deserves. So tonight we'll stop at um, finishing off these frets uh, and then tomorrow we'll have another day maybe for a post Christmas lunch uh, distraction. I'll do a bit of work on these, trying to secure these uh, volume and tone controls which are currently spinning loose, or in danger of spinning loose, because the minute they do actually spin loose then basically you've got wires disconnecting and you're, you're into a non-functioning um, situation, so we don't want that. So we need to fix them down again properly. But also, uh, before I finish tonight, also have a quick look to see what the um, see what the uh, the new tuners would look like. If that's what we end up putting on, assuming the other ones are unserviceable. Okay. Slowly getting there. Once we get past this 800 stage, then we go into the micro mesh stage, which is very satisfying. It really does feel like you're heading towards the final polish. Um, but again, don't rush the 800 stage. Give it as much time as you can. It's, it's taking down very little metal. Um, it's very good to keep, still keep it even, even though you're not taking much off. It's better that what you do take off is, is uh, done even across the, across the net. Stage normally I would do with the pointed foam block, um, but as I say, in the absence of that, uh, I'm going to have to just use my fingers. It's a bit odd. I'm going to work it out where that's gone. I think that's a good idea trying to work it out in the darkness. Um, so like we have got this one here. <laughs> Sort of. Dong. Let's see what this one works like. Okay, so we go for the micro mesh. It's the kind of last rundown now. We start with 1800, and just bearing in mind, then you're going from 800. Sorry, that should be 1500. You're going from 800 to 1500 in one jump. So we want to give that a bit of time 
to um, kind of reduce the 800 scratches down to 1500. quite good. sort of speed and rhythm that you can with the correct shape foam block but hey okay that's 1500 let's do 18 uh yeah 18 Actually, um, nothing noticeable is coming off in terms of um, the abrasiveness, but it's clearly still doing something. Um, it's still abrasive, it's polishing, um, just not at the level we can see it in the eye. and we're, we're ready to take off all the tape. Ebenezer Scrooge gets ready to receive the first of three visits from the ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present and Christmas yet to come. Last three. So fine and abrasive that you couldn't 
tell it was in fact an abrasive sheet at all. It feels a bit like a, I don't know, a chamois leather or something. Right, that's good. Done. Can hear the rain falling outside now. Okay, so this is the point where we uh, let's just gently unpick our hmm. move this around, can it? Sorry. It's all a bit of a mess over here. Don't want to look at the bright lights. All right, move things out of the way, sort of roughly. Okay, so I'm just going to unhook the masking tape. Again, it often leaves a bit of glue behind, but that's okay. You can you pick that up with the nap. The most important job is done. That you know, it's there to protect uh, protect the finish from the sandpaper and filing that we've just done. Um, so I've done that job very well. It's a bit of a faff to get it all off now, but better than wondering how you're going to repair uh, some scratched lacquer. I mean, anything that's leaving behind now is just you know, a bit of gum that can be taken off with that so easily. Twice I've done that. You can, you can see quite a lot of metal swarf on here, so it's going to need, um, need a, a good clean off to make sure it's free of all that abrasive stuff. You know, doing your frets is a destructive process. I mean, by that, I mean that. Um, it is taking away material, it's cutting away, cutting into metal. Uh, and so it's, it's leaving a lot of metal swarf behind it. But it's destructive for the right reasons. Okay, so I'll have this off in a minute. Mr. Scrooge, the bells have stopped. Okay. <clears throat> Nearly there. Come on, there's some fiddly little bits here that are being really annoying. The reason that's hard is because they're caught up. These tabs are supposed to make it easier. But they've got a bit caught up in the meanwhile, meantime. Okay, so. Once we get onto these tabbed bits, they should come off easier. Except where they stick in the wrong place. Okay. This is how it's meant to undo. A bit like this. So I'm hoping that this guitar will become my band rehearsing and possibly playing in gigs guitar. Um, I was going to say if, but I have to be positive and say when I get to January, um, or not January, perhaps April, March, April, we do some do some dates, which would be, so it sounds a very odd thing to say when you haven't done it, or it's not something new, um, especially at the age of 52 or whatever, 51, 52, something like that. It's kind of a teenage thing, isn't it? Coming out and playing in pubs, which is quite a funny one, especially because I don't drink. So I go to a place that I wouldn't normally go to, to hang out and play music for people who are drinking. It's just weird. There we are. 
I think in years years ago when I was uh, in bands of sorts when I was younger, um, I think kind of getting a bit drunk was part of it, which is really st stupid and counterproductive when you stop and think about it. But I don't think I could have. I don't think I would have even stood up in front of anybody um, with a guitar if I hadn't had at least some alcohol in me. And I, I do remember a gig somewhere with bottles of special brew standing on an amp. No, I can't tell you. <laughs> Probably no surprise I can't tell you when when it was or where it was. Suffice to say it was a very, very long time ago. And obviously so memorable that it's almost forgotten. Okay, so here comes the final paper off and we're heading towards a good cleanup. And then what I'll probably do as well uh, is give the fretboard an oil because it looks a bit dry. Um, not that I'm a massive fan of oil on fretboard, but does make it look a bit nicer. Okay, let's junk out of the way. Bring back my, no, not that one, cloth. Get some of this out. So I'll just whiz over with naphtha. Um, but it's a really nice feeling now, having invested all of that time and effort, we now have confidence in a pile of frets that are beautifully level um, in relation to each other and which will now allow us to play uh, to, to set an action which is much much better than we could have done before uh, and and in addition um, because of the re Profiling, oh, sorry, re, yeah, reprofiling and polishing. Those frets are going to also feel a lot better anyway because the, uh, the the wear on the fretboard has now been removed, and so they're kind of shiny, like as if they were new. No, they're obviously not new because they're, they're nowhere near as tall, or the frets haven't got as much metal on as they would have done on the first day when they came out of the factory uh, however many years ago that was so that's, that's kind of that's a given um, but with what material there is left I can assure you they are now in a lovely rejuvenated fresh shiny condition which is brilliant okay so lid on here um, just a quick quick little visual um, nice and shiny. Kind of more importantly, though, that they're they're level. Um, I'm just gonna grab me a bit of oil, which is kicking around in here. I'll just leave some oil soaking in over the next couple of days, or however long it takes to do what we're doing. Um, just it'll pick up some dust as well um, that's the only thing about putting oil on your fingerboard is it, it does make it, it attracts grime as well as making it look nicer and sort of uh, I don't know, people kind of they say a fingerboard looks dry and then they go and put oil on it to so called hydrate it but that's a bit nuts really when what you're really doing is just making it slippery um, that's because you think about it oil and would uh, kind of mix, although there are some kinds of wood that produce a sort of oily substance, but you know, oil, wood, wood, wood and oil are not natural partners. So this is kind of, whatever, whatever people say, this, I think this is more cosmetic than anything. It just gives it a luster. Um, that makes the thing look more attractive, but I'm absolutely sure the fretboard itself doesn't really care. Right, so that's the 
beautiful looking uh, done neck and um, as I say we could just have a look at how one of these tuners works in the I just want to see how it looks for a second obviously it won't be positioned correctly or anything but okay that's all one let's go with this one so they fit nicely uh, these alternatives and they would by the looks of it they'd also do up very quickly and very easily so that's the, the look of it quite small by comparison um, to the other ones but hey you know you don't have to have massive tuners on a guitar like this uh, alternative is I do have some vintage looking things somewhere yeah. Yeah. And a complete set vintage that would require uh, different holes actually and also uh, they're, they're, they're quite nice looking but they're not made for this for these post holes so I think I will give those a miss all manner of things knocking about here what have we got? a set of three asides Hmm. Chrome, chrome three sides. I think, unless I'm mistaken, these are all in good shape. Let's have a look at one of these, see how they look. Anyway, it's nice to have options, that's a good thing. That fits in nicely. Actually, probably a better, um, better fit in terms of button size, but I do like the easy lock units they're much more dependable in terms of the tuning stability so uh, I might go with the smaller buttons but the tuning stability there we have a choice the oval large buttons are quite nice but the uh, Wilkinson easy locks will do the job beautifully um, It do look small, that's for sure. It's a big head and small tuners. But nobody really knows what matters is what works. So I think I prefer the stability of the easy locks. There's no, there's no need to scrimp on anything. Um, but the question for me that comes up first is just check and see whether the, the ones we've taken off actually are faulty seems like it is but I won't jump to the conclusions until I've tested it. So you can go back in there as an alternative if possible. You go there because you are the Wilkinsons and put this guitar down here now. Right folks so that's the uh, the neck done on that Victoria Rockstar Guitar, so um, it's heading for Christmas Day, so I will uh, check you out and see you later. I hope you enjoyed that, I hope it was useful. Those of you who have seen quite a few of these videos will be sick to death of that process, but um, on the good plus side, at least you better do it with your eyes closed, a bit like me. Okay, happy Christmas, see you tomorrow. <laughs>